Lay down a list of what is wrong. Things you told them all along. Pray to God He hears you. And pray to God He hears you. And where did I go wrong? I lost a friend somewhere along in the bitterness. And I would I stayed up with you all night. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Back. Fired, an NBA history podcast about bad teams, bad luck, and bad decisions. My name is Lewis, and today we're going to talk about one of the Dallas Mavericks and the entire league's great what-if stories. That would be Roy Tarpley, who played parts of six seasons for the Mavs from the mid-80s to the mid-90s. Tarpley showed a lot of promise early in his career as a huge rebounder off the bench. Uh, he could do a lot more than that as well, but he started off elite at that, and other things came a little bit later. He only played in six out of the 11 seasons that he was considered an active NBA player, but faced suspensions and injuries at inopportune times. But let's consider for a moment what Tarpley's peak could have been before we start from the very beginning of his story. So in the 1988 playoffs, which the Mavs had been to the playoffs five years in a row at that point, they made it all the way to the Western Conference Finals in 1988 to match up with the Los Angeles Lakers. Now, the Mavs pushed the eventual champions to seven games, eventually did fall to the Lakers, but one of the breakout stars of the playoffs that year was Roy Tarpley. He came off the bench to average 18 points, 13 rebounds, 2.7 stocks, shot it well from the field, especially when you consider that even as a near seven-footer, he wasn't just dunking and laying it up. He was taking mid-range jumpers, he was pulling up off the dribble, diming people up, grabbing the rebound, and pushing the ball up the floor in transition, really just doing things that big men in that era, the late 80s, typically did not do. And this is as a second-year pro in his first real exposure to the limelight. The Mavs, of course, had made the playoffs the year before, but they lost in the first round. Tarpley seemed to be somebody who was young and full of promise and, you know, a, a star big man of the future. He was 23 years old in 1988. But what nobody knew was that his NBA career was over halfway over at that point. He had played 156 out of his eventual 280 regular season games and all but three of the playoff games that he would ever appear in. So what happened? Well, we are going to get started with his story in his home state of Michigan. But first, uh, I wanted to tell you all the result of the, I guess, I think I called it like a special meeting that I was going to have uh, right after I was recording that last episode. So I've been invited to join Playback, which is a site that allows creators to host sports watch parties and give alternative commentary for games. I am primarily using it for NBA, but I think most sports are on it, it seems. So please sign up for Playback, log in with your TV provider. It does require TV login and watch NBA games with me. There's a chat function. It's basically like if we were on Twitch and you were watching me play video games, but instead we're watching basketball together. So sounds cool to me. That's why I joined it. Cool opportunity. And uh, I've already done a few watch parties at this point, and it's been pretty fun. So do join me. The link is in the description of this episode. It's playback.tv slash backfired NBA pod. And there's a calendar with all the streams that I've got currently scheduled to start mostly Grizzlies games, but I'm not just going to stick to Grizzlies games and I'm looking forward to interacting with everybody on playback. So anyway, let's get started with the Roy Tarpley story. So Tarpley played at the University of Michigan. He played all four years, and his most productive season was his junior year when he led the Wolverines to the Big Ten regular season championship in 1985. Tarpley averaged 19 points, 10 and a half rebounds, over two blocks per game, and he was just an absolutely dominant college big man that year, and fittingly, one Big Ten player of the year that season. Unfortunately, the Wolverines were unable to capitalize on his dominance. In 1985, they won in the first round against Fairleigh Dickinson, but lost in the round of 32 to Villanova, which seems like the Villanova and Michigan matchup happens a lot. Nova just seems to win every single one, and as somebody born into a family of Villanova haters, that absolutely pains me. But Michigan was 26-4 and that year, and they followed that up with a 28-5 and season which again won the regular season title, but unfortunately they still could not make it past the second round in the NCAA tournament. After his time in Ann Arbor, it was time for him to go into the draft, and he was selected seventh overall by the Dallas Mavericks with one of the many first-round picks that Bill Stepien handed over to Dallas during his brief reign of terror in Cleveland. 
And to hear more about that, go listen to episode four of this podcast about the Stepien rule. There's literally a rule named after a guy because he was so bad at his job. That's impressive. But Dallas, being a brand new team in 1980, was so glad to be handed a ton of really good first round picks by a really bad team. And one of those picks turned into Roy Tarpley, who joined what had been a playoff team the three seasons before Tarpley joined. One of the perks of getting high draft picks from a stupid and shitty team like the Cavaliers of the early 1980s is that they're all really high picks. So Tarpley joined a team where all but one player was under the age of 30. And this 87 Mavericks team was really good and uncommonly healthy. Every one of their regular starters started in at least 76 games. Their starting lineup that first year was Derek Harper at the point guard. He was second team all defense that season, averaging 16 points, eight assists, and over two steals. Harper was drafted with a pick that the Cavs traded to Dallas. Rolando Blackman at shooting guard, he averaged 21 points per game that season, and he was named an all-star for the third year in a row. He was part of the return for Kiki Vandaway, who refused to play for Dallas and demanded a trade when he was first drafted. More on that in episode 13 of this podcast. Mark Aguirre at the small forward. He was the first overall pick in the 1981 draft. He was Dallas's other all-star this year. He averaged just under 27 a game this season. Aguirre would later win two championships with the bad boy Pistons. Sam Perkins at power forward. He was one of the rare big men who shot threes, although he didn't really start pulling until he arrived in Seattle several years down the line from this. But Perkins was the product of a Cleveland pick. And then James Donaldson, who was a very solid starting center, but interestingly in 1988 was named an all-star as an injury replacement. And he's widely regarded as one of the most puzzling and undeserved all-star selections of all time. Because at the time, he was averaging about 7 points and 10 rebounds at the All-Star break, but he was, in fact, the next in line because the All-Star voting for Western Conference centers that year was first place, Hakeem Olajuwon, second place, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, third place, Steve Johnson, who was injured, fourth place, James Donaldson, and then fifth place, Mark Eaton. So the fans relished getting to see Donaldson check into the All-Star game and put up 2 points, 6 rebounds, and 2 blocks in 8 minutes. But anyway, so Roy Tarpley is a bench player for that team. I won't say the sixth man just yet because Detlef Schrempf is on that team as well. And uh, this 1987 team was the best team in Mavs history up until that point. They won 55 games. They were the two seed. And unfortunately, they were the first ever two seed to be upset by a seventh seed. Uh, they lost three to one in the first round to the Seattle Supersonics. And in the regular season, Tarpley put up seven and a half points and seven rebounds plus one block in 18 minutes per game uh seven rebounds per game in 18 minutes is an insane figure he did not qualify for any leaderboards because he didn't play enough minutes but to put that into context his total rebounding percentage was right between charles barkley and charles oakley who of course were some of the best rebounders in the league that year and his 13.7 rebounds per 36 minutes were second in the league only to larry smith of the warriors so i say all that to say from the jump Roy Tarpley was one of the best rebounders in the league, and he made his presence known in the playoffs when in his first career playoff game, he went for 25 points and 11 rebounds as the Mavericks steamrolled the Supersonics in game one. Of course, they went on to lose that series. Dale Ellis, who had spent three years on the bench in Dallas, got his revenge after the trade to Seattle. But Tarpley and the Mavs used that defeat as a springboard to climb to new heights. So in 1988, the Mavs won 53 games and made it all the way to the Western Conference Finals. Tarpley won the Sixth Man of the Year award after putting up 13.5 points and about 12 rebounds per game. He was the best rebounder in the league on a per-minute or per-possession basis. And then the Mavs beat Hakeem Olajuwon's Rockets 3-1 to in the first round, beat Alex English's Nuggets 4-2 to in the second round. And then they had a matchup with the Los Angeles Lakers that came down to the final game, and the Lakers had home court advantage won the first two games easily. The Mavs took each of their home games, knotted the series up 2-2. Two to two. Lakers won game five. Mavs squeaked past the Lakers in game six to force game seven. And then in that game, the Lakers just completely overpowered the Mavs. But Roy Tarpley, again, showed what he could do. What an addition Tarpley is. Inside, outside, rebounder, runs the floor, handles the ball. He's going to be a great one if he keeps on this track. In 17 playoff games off the bench, he averaged 18 points and 13 rebounds, 1.2 steals, a block and a half. Just showed off an incredible skill level. I mean, this guy could really 
shoot the ball inside the arc. He could finish through contact, do reverse layups, grab the ball and push it up in transition or throw a hit ahead pass to a streaking teammate. Things that you really would not expect of a big man coming off the bench in the 1980s, like I mentioned. So really incredible stuff from Tarpley so soon after college. And it looked like the Mavs were building something, like they were going to be the next great team in the Western Conference as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was getting old. He was 40 at this point, but they still had Magic Johnson and Byron Scott, James Worthy, A.C. Green. But the, you know, the four main Mavericks were all hitting their prime, Harper, Blackman, Aguirre, and Perkins. And then Tarpley was only 23, and he, you know, seemingly was only going to keep getting better. But unfortunately, as we see all the time, the things that we assume are going to happen, you know, about young teams, they can go awry. How many great young teams have we seen fail to live up to their title expectations? How many great young cores are torn apart by egos, or in this case, egos and personal tragedy? Mark Aguirre was traded from the Mavericks to the Bad Boy Pistons in the middle of the 1989 season. His teammates seemingly were not all that sad to see him go. James Donaldson told the New York Times, quote, We were ready to get someone that would come in here and play hard every night. Mark would just loaf around and not give good effort in some games. And then that same New York Times article described him as being, quote, temperamentally unpredictable. The Mavs received in return Adrian Dantley, who was a great scorer to be sure. Uh, you tend to hear of him as being the premier empty calorie player, but I, I haven't dug too deep into that personally. I think there's a section in Thinking Basketball about how you know, kind of worthless Adrian Dantley's scoring was in the uh, grand scheme of things. But Dantley isn't the focus of this episode, and really the Mavericks aren't either. I just wanted to give a thorough background of the situation before getting into the real meat and potatoes of this episode. As I mentioned at the top, at this point in Roy Tarpley's career, through the loss to the Lakers in the conference finals in 88, as incredible as it sounds, he was already halfway through his NBA career in terms of total number of games played. He'd played 156 regular season games and 21 playoff games, 177 total, and in his career, he would play a total of 304. So why is that? Why did this supremely talented player flame out of the league after showing such a great knack for rebounding and possessing such a high skill level on offense? Well, unfortunately, he was not well. In the summer of 1987, right after his rookie season, he voluntarily entered a treatment program to help him with his cocaine and alcohol addiction. He didn't miss any games, and he got to come right back to the Mavs. Rick Sund, who was the GM of the Mavs at that point, he made it clear that since he asked for help and it hadn't interfered with the team, they weren't going to punish Tarpley for his drug use, but he was put down for a first strike by the NBA's anti-drug protocol. But in 1989, it did interfere with the team. He had been taking drug tests as a follow-up to his rehab program. In, he was in aftercare. And in January of 1989, he tested positive again for cocaine. So as a result, the NBA suspended him indefinitely for what wound up being 49 games. So he didn't play from January 3rd until April 12th of 1989. And in that time, the Mavs, who had started 17-10, and 10, then went 17-33, and 33, traded Aguirre and Detlef Schrempf, and they lost James Donaldson for the year with a knee injury. So their season just completely went downhill. And as can happen for people struggling with addiction, it kept going downhill for Tarpley as well. In the 1989-90 to 90 season, although he had signed a three-year contract extension with the Mavericks, he just wasn't able to get the monkey off of his back. Tarpley no-showed to practice one day and was unaccounted for for about 22 hours, said that his alarm clock was faulty and that he'd overslept. He, he knew that he was going to get in trouble, and so he went to his mom's house to hide out and lay low for a while. But unfortunately for him, he was a professional athlete and a very high-profile one at that point, so that only made matters worse as his disappearance made the national news. It also prompted another drug test, which he did pass, but everyone in the Mavs organization trusted him a little bit less than they had before at that point. After his 49-game suspension, he had two strikes, so that meant that he had one chance remaining from the anti-drug program until he was banned from the league for at least two years. And he just narrowly avoided that ban the very next month in November of 1989 when he was arrested for DWI, which he pled guilty to, and resisting arrest, a charge which was dropped. He was again suspended for a couple months by the NBA, but he was not banned from the league because, once again, a drug test for cocaine came back negative, so he served out his suspension, came back, and for the first time in his career, he was a consistent starter in Dallas in the second half of the 1990 season. Now, the Mavs, unfortunately, were swept in the first round of the playoffs by the Portland Trailblazers, who went on to the finals against the Pistons that year. 
But then five games into the following season, Tarpley tore his ACL and was out for the season. And that's so unfortunate because the Mavs started 4-1 and one and Tarpley himself was off to a really hot start. Now, toward the end of that season, while he was rehabbing in late March of 1991, Tarpley was again arrested, this time on suspicion of drunk driving, which he was acquitted for and then suspended once again, but not banned. In May of 1991, he battered uh, a woman who was not his wife, a secret girlfriend dislocated her shoulder when she said that she was going to leave. Those charges were dropped. And just after his court case for the March arrest was settled, all signs pointed to Tarpley coming back to the Mavs, being healthy, being engaged, being ready to go. He was looking great on the court. He was good mentally. After the case, he told the press, quote, you're going to see the same Roy Tarpley on the basketball court, but you're not going to see any more of my private life splashed all across the papers. He said that he was a changed man. His outlook on life was changed, and all of those issues of the, over the past few years had matured him. But then he skipped a day of training camp with what he called an upset stomach, and then he felt that he was being unfairly punished because the Mavs sent an assistant coach to the hotel to see if he was actually sick. And that, honestly, well-deserved lack of trust seemed to have been a trigger for him because he then traveled back to Houston to meet with former NBA player John Lucas, who ran the rehab facility that he'd attended. And he did that without first securing permission from the team, and that caused the NBA to drug test him once again. But he refused to take that drug test, and as a result, he was banned from the league for at least two years. Now, in that time, he played for a Continental Basketball Association team in Texas. He played for an ABA team in Miami, and then he went to Greece to play for two different teams, waiting for a, a reinstatement from Commissioner Stern that may never come. But he was reinstated, and after being banned from the NBA for three full seasons, he made his return to the Mavericks in 1994, signed to a six-year, $25.8 million contract, and came off the bench for 55 games. And that season, he struggled with knee injuries, so he was a little bit off and on, but he made it through the season. Now, by that point, the Mavs were rebuilding. All of his teammates from his early days in Dallas were long gone. He was playing alongside Jason Kidd, Jimmy Jackson, and Jamal Mashburn at this point. And being 30 and having not played NBA basketball in three seasons, he was good, but he was, he was much less effective on the floor. He failed his physical before the 1996 season and unfortunately then gave in to his temptation to drink shortly thereafter and was banned from the league again, this time for life. And there were warning signs during that season. He allegedly showed up to a few games drunk. He missed two weeks with the stated reason being that he dropped a water bottle on his foot. Uh, that makes no sense. All the reporting just says he dropped a water bottle on his foot. And then he claimed that the pancreatitis that he failed the physical with uh, was due to his love of hot sauce. Now, although his NBA career was over, his troubles didn't stop there. He was charged again with domestic violence and put on probation for that. Uh, the, the girlfriend that he had battered on at least three separate occasions then actually got hit by a car and killed on the highway, so it seems that her lack of testimony is part of the reason he only got probation. Tarpley then played a large part of his professional career overseas. He played in Greece, Cyprus, Russia, China, and then in American minor leagues when he finally returned to the United States. He violated his probation by leaving the state of Texas to play overseas, so he was technically an international fugitive for several years, only came back to the United States to turn himself in when he got spooked by the prospect of the United States invading Iraq and the possibility of a larger war in the Middle East and Asia breaking out as a result. Now, his NBA career was pretty tragic, and his talent certainly should have afforded him a better career than he had. But the Mavs organization and the owner, Don Carter, really did all they could to support him through his struggles with addiction. You read the quotes from Don Carter, and despite him being, you know, th this, this billionaire guy, he's not really all that concerned outwardly with the fact that he's making bad business deals by signing Tarpley to these big money long-term contracts. He really seems genuinely concerned that Tarpley is unable to break the cycle of, of addiction because he really seems to care about him as a person, which is really nice. Uh, but it, it seems like it may have been too late. And I say that because allegedly he was enabled and not encouraged to get help when he was in college at the University of Michigan. In an interview where the main point was to defend Michigan Fab Five era coach Steve Fisher, who had been fired after allegations about a Michigan booster seemed to implicate him. A former Michigan team captain named Leslie Rockymore said, well, that booster was brought in under the previous coach, Bill Frieder, 
Oh, and Roy Tarpley never passed a drug test, but Bill Frieder still let him play no matter what. Other players who failed drug tests got suspended, but not Tarpley. So it makes sense that Rick Sund and Norm Sanju, uh, who were running the Mavs at that point, said way back in Tarpley's first NBA offseason, when he voluntarily checked himself into the treatment program, that they said they hadn't heard from his Michigan coaches about any drug problems that Tarpley had had or uh, any any problems at all outside of Tarpley being benched for one single NCAA tournament game for bringing beer to the hotel. They hadn't heard about it and there was no record because Frieder allegedly was covering it up. Frieder, of course, has denied that charge and there's no way to find out the truth for sure, but if that's true, it certainly does make a lot of sense. Now, regardless, Tarpley's career could have been really, really great if he weren't stuck in the grasp of his cocaine and alcohol addiction. Very sad. You, you hate to see somebody who's so talented not be able to reach the heights that they should be able to reach because of things that are really outside of their control. Uh, he is a cautionary tale to be sure. He's one of the very few people to be permanently banned from life for the NBA for drug-related reasons. The others are John Drew, Chris Washburn, Richard Dumas, and O.J. Mayo. And there are people who were banned for a set period of time and later reinstated, like Tarpley himself the first time. But those four and Tarpley are the only people to be banned for life for drugs. So anyway, just like with the Bison Deli episode, uh, the Roy Tarpley story is incredibly depressing to research and uh, to talk about. So the next episode I, I do will have to be a little bit lighter in tone, but that's just how it goes sometimes when the NBA crosses paths with the uh, the dark side of life. The stories could be actually sad and not like sports sad, not like, oh, this team played bad. But regardless, I'm grateful to be able to tell stories of all kinds. Grateful that you'll listen. I really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Be sure to follow the show on social media at Backfired NBA Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And uh, yet another reminder, as I mentioned at the top, to uh, join me for watch parties on playback. Yeah. That's all. Uh, thanks for listening, and we will talk again in two weeks. All right. Have a good one. Baby, are you going to be the one that saves me? And after all, you're my wonder wall.